Well now, fast charging has hit all new heights in 2023 with this here, the launch of Realme's GT3. Now the GT3 will fully charge its 4,600 milliamp hour battery in just nine minutes and 30 seconds. Blazing fast. Now I haven't actually been able to achieve that myself in my own testing, but not far off it. And I'll let you know my exact times in this review. Now, if you don't know the rest of the specs of this particular phone here, well, it's got a 6.74 inch, 144 hertz screen, powered by the Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1, a 50 megapixel rear camera, 8 megapixel ultra wide, and two megapixel microscopic camera. Now, unfortunately, I did not get the retail box with it, so I don't have the TPU case that you should get with it, a clear one. But I do have, of course, the charger and our cable. So it's a standard size, and you'll see that it is a Type-C to Type-C cable. Now, the charger is a little larger than normal because it is that real beefy 240 watts. Compared that to, like, a standard size, you can see it is a little bigger, but not that bad. Now, this charger does support charging other devices, like at 100 watts. You've got even power delivery support uh, for 65 watts, if you've got one of those laptops that supports 65 watts power delivery or other devices, then you can still use this charger, which is at least handy to have. Captain Obvious here that I've got the white version. Now it is a frosted white, so that means it's a matte finish to it and you don't pick up any fingerprints. They do not show, uh, pretty hard for me to show it right here. Now this area, it's where we've got their little light. So we've got some RGB that lights up around here and you can see it now in action. Now the settings for this is, it's kind of weird. It's hidden away under where the wallpapers are for style in there. That's where you'll be able to discover that and adjust some of those settings and tweak this. And it even has the Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1 chip. It's not the actual chip there because of course the cooler would be over it and everything else, but it's, it's nice. I, I don't mind this look to it. Now then with our cameras, we've got our main 50 megapixel camera. Now this particular camera here does have optical image stabilization and we are looking at a Sony sensor too. So normally the Sony's are a little bit better and this one here is the IMX 890 from them and 50 megapixels. Then we have a rather useless 2 megapixel camera and a poor 8 megapixel ultra wide that you'll see later on. It's a real letdown, these two other secondary cameras. I would have preferred that they just put in here, say a 13 or 16 megapixel decent sensor with autofocus for the ultra wide and macro camera would have been good. So the Realme branding here looks decent. It's nice and small. There's no massive dare to leap, but there is a course with the status LED. Well, the LED that's in here, the RGB. So down the bottom, the SIM tray here takes two nano SIMs. We've got a microphone, Type-C port that is USB 2 speed. Sadly, no video out, at least in all my testing. Doesn't seem to support video out. Loudspeaker down here and up the top, we've got another mic port here for the loudspeaker, IR transmitter. So this frame, it might look like it's metal, but no, it's not. It is plastic. So the reasoning behind this is probably for weight reduction and also reduction in the cost of making this. There is our power button. So being plastic here probably lowers the weight down a little because it is 199 grams instead of, say, the standard now for this kind of size would probably be about 219 grams. So they've got it under 200 grams. The thickness, well, it is 8.9 millimeters, which isn't bad. So curvature to the end of it here and of course the screen that is 100% flat. Now this screen here is supposed to be 144 hertz, but I've only seen it run seen it run at a maximum of 120 hertz. Currently it's at 60. There seems to be a bit of a bug with the firmware. Okay, you can see when I'm moving it now, the adaptive is taking over and it's changing between 60 and 120 hertz refresh. Finally, on the left side, we've got two volume up and down buttons. Overall build quality, I would rate as good. It's decent. There's nothing wrong with it at all. There's no sharp edges. It would have been nice if it had a metal frame, would make it feel a little bit more premium there. But as mentioned, cost reduction, weight reduction is probably the reasoning behind that. The GT3, of course, is all about that super VOC charge. That's 240 watts. That's a hell of a lot of power going into it, but it's very safe. They've done a lot of tests on this. They went over in their presentation quite a bit all about that safety there and the amount of cycles too this can take. So it's 1600 cycles before it drops down to 80% the battery, which is 
pretty damn impressive. Now the charger of course being a little bit bigger, it does get a little hot when it charges it at 240 watts, but again there's so much built in safety, it does all these checks, you can check that all out on their official press release information, I won't repeat it all here, but just to say that it is safe, you don't need to worry about, I don't think there's any concern about that. So it's 4,600 milliamp hours and I'll get on to my charge times I get and the battery life and all that will all be covered in this review of course of the GT3. Then let me talk a little bit about this display. You probably know that it's a 6.74 inch screen and they do claim 144 hertz maximum, but I've never been able to get that as I just mentioned before. So if I do go here into the settings, I just want to quickly show you that we've got some adaptive settings for that, okay, for the adaptive refresh rate. So normally on auto select, you see it'll probably now go over to 60. Oh, it hasn't yet, but eventually, well, there it goes. Well, it's flashing between... 60s, probably because of this animation, it's staying on 120. Now, if you force it to high, which claims here you get the 144 hertz, I don't actually see that. I've never seen it. And even forcing it to the high, it will still swap between 60 and 120. And I have noticed at times it's being locked. Even though I've set this, there is a bit of a bug where it will just be the whole time at 60 frames per second. It's dropped down now, but even when I'm just moving about, you would see that with this display. Now, I love the fact that this is a completely flat display and it does look very good to my eyes. Uh, the brightness, so it can peak. We do have uh, quite a decent 1400 nits. It's very good, but it's typically around about 500. So the peak brightness is when it's in the sun. And yes, you can make it out in direct sunlight. Now we've got some of the ultra vision engine stuff in here. To me, most of this is just marketing kind of jargon that I don't really cover a lot in my videos because, well, when you use it, it doesn't really add that much value at all. And I just find, find I normally just turn it off. In fact, it's so good that the brands with this kind of stuff, they normally leave it off anyway. So go figure. Then our UI, it's based on Android 13. This is Realme UI 4.0, which really is color OS. Now, if you go straight into the app store, which I've enabled, you see it's automatically going to pop up here and search. So they've made some changes. I've disabled some recommended apps that show at the top, which was a little bit annoying. Now, of course, you've got options that you can manage this. You've got your settings here. And this is one of the things that I would turn off too. So the search notification thing, this was the personalized searched search there and add apps prediction, which um, was a bit of an annoyance there. I don't know kind of why they've added these features by default, because when you go into it, you always get that keyboard popping up. You had all that space taken up. And for some reason, I've still got that coming up there. But it is very fast and fluid. That's one thing I have to give to them, that the performance of it is excellent. Launch times for those apps. I mean, we do have, of course, UFS 3.1 storage here. And we've got the reasonably fast RAM too, which is the LPDDR5. Everything's very, very, very quick here with Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1. So the bug is for me is the thing to do with the refresh rate is one of the bugs that is present. Apart from that, it's pretty good. Now, the recent apps here that when you go through them, a lot of the times, if it's something like, oh, Twitty here would probably, there we go, it's going to reload. So everything keeps closing very quickly. So I've got 16 gigabytes of RAM. But really, it's a bit of just a marketing gimmicky thing because that 16 gigabytes of RAM, you will not be able to take advantage of that, okay? So here you can see scrolling is up to 120 frames per second, 120 hertz. That is good. But it's just the RAM, if you want to load it up, if you like multitasking like crazy, you want to have uh, one app open and then just go back to them all the time. As long as you keep switching over to them and don't leave a few minutes gap or five minutes, you could be okay. But it closes things off quite quickly so i do find the ui to be a bit aggressive in that regard there now with the ram we do have this which is kind of unneeded really again because you can really never take advantage of this physical ram so you don't really need this ram expansion which i don't like brands how they do this they call it ram expansion like you're adding actual physical ram like hey i just downloaded four gigabytes more of ram it's caching, it's what it is. So this is virtual memory really, and you can add up to 12 gigabytes, which is great, which is gonna probably help speed things up a little bit, but with 16 gigabytes again, really honestly not needed. So the Snapdragon Gen 1 of course does support 5G, and I'll just go over a few other things too that I've noticed. Unfortunately, Realme is heading towards the dark side like other companies out there, Xiaomi's included in this group here that just cram on huge amount of bloatware. You can see all these apps, you probably have to go along and spend a good like 20 minutes cleaning up, uninstalling a lot of this junk bloatware that's 
on the phone pre-installed, and I really wish that they would cut back on this. Now, the brands, I've heard this many times, claim they do this because it's going to save the end user money, um, but not really. No, it's probably more to do with maximizing their profits, profits because the developers will pay them uh, and make deals with them, so their applications are already pre-installed on the phones. So free amount of storage that you do get on first boot when you get your nice new shiny phone is around about approximately 200 and... 36 gigabytes or so, sorry, 226 gigabytes, which is a decent amount, but remember, no micro SD card support. I mean, those days are gone, completely gone. Now, charge time with the 240 watt amazing charging speed is officially nine minutes and 30 seconds, I believe it is, but I've never been able to achieve that. Now, I've done my charging tests probably about five times now. I always get about 12 minutes, you can see. So 4% to 93, in fact, that was 100, took 12 minutes. Battery life now with the GT3 is a little disappointing. Now I did force here the refresh rate to uh, 144 hertz, which in reality is actually 120 hertz, and it ran for eight hours and 34 minutes with the fixed test here. Now if you check all my other reviews of phones, you can compare them. That's why I do this test because it's fixed. It's always exactly the same, same brightnesses. This is a disappointing result. It will only really get around about six hours of screen on time, if that. Uh, but of course, you can charge the phone in an amazing rate. Like in two minutes, you get, or three minutes or something, you get like 40%, 50% battery capacity. So it's not a biggie, but not an amazing battery life there for it. Uh, this is another test that I did do for the charge time. So from 1% to 100, it all worked out here correctly. The timer stopped as soon as it hit 100 at 12 minutes again. So I don't know why I can't achieve the nine minutes and 30 seconds. Um, not that it matters, 12 minutes is amazingly quick. That's blazing fast, so just, wow, really good there. Uh, Netflix is not supported for some reason with Google Play Store. You can side load it, load it, you can download an APK file, uh, then it'll be working there. It does have a wide vine level one search, so Amazon Prime Video Netflix should be in 1080p there. Uh, but it doesn't show any support, I believe. It showed no support for HDR there too, which is um, a minor thing that hopefully is going to come through with firmware updates. So it has UFS 3.1 storage, which is now last gen because we're on US, US, uh, UFS 4.0. And these speeds for last gen, I mean, they're still really quick. This is not going to bottleneck any phone. Those random reads writes are amazing. They, they're good. No issues there with that. Uh, camera 2 API, that is supported, so you'll be happy to know that, that with the ultra-wide, the front and the rear cameras, you can use Gcam ports, open camera, if you wanted to do so with full access. Then now, and 2 to benchmark. I did notice that this is the only app so far in benchmark apps where you do actually get, look, 144 hertz. There it is. When you're using it, you're touching it. It will go up to 144 hertz and then scale right, right back down to 72. So that is very interesting behavior and a little bit suspicious too that just in benchmarks they will boost this performance up. And it's a little bit artificial too if you ask me and it's the only area we're getting the 144 hertz. So it seems yes the display can do it, the panel can do the 144 hertz just only in benchmark apps. So it is a very good score here, over a million points for a Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1, that's excellent. And watch as I just get out of that. It goes right down then to 60 hertz and it's at 120. Even though I still have forced in the settings here, I'm pretty sure it's still selected unless it's changed itself. Uh, this here on the, yes, screen rate is forced to high, but it still goes down to 60. So it's kind of all over the place. Again, the firmware needs to be updated, fixed. This is a very early version of it. And then the gaming performance is good, so there is the vapor chamber cooling in there. They've done a bit of work to it, and I am running their GT mode here. Now, there's a lot of really cool advanced settings in here that I do like, so I can even display the frame rate there, how much the GPU is being utilized. You can see all of that information here, and they've even got some GPU settings too, which other manufacturers, other brands aren't really offering this. So you can select, for example, the uh, different filtering levels there, the MSAA, you can scale that back if you wanted to. I just keep it all on default, but it's great to have these options. And maybe if you are someone that's just looking for the best performance possible, you could put this into the performance mode, losing a little bit of the image quality as a result, but gaining perhaps maybe just a few frames per second. 
So I haven't made any adjustments there, but it's still always going to say that for some reason. Now the frame rate in Genshin Impact is normally around 60 frames per second, but I have noticed that after you play for about like 20 minutes or so, it does drop down a little bit. It throttles a tiny little bit, and then you kind of get around the 50s and late 40s with the frame rate. But um, that that is normal for Snapdragon, Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1. Eventually it throttles down a little, um, but at the beginning, like right now, with not too much action going on, this is pretty good, right? This is uh, still 60 frames per second. So good gaming performance because remember, this is Genshin Impact and I do have it, by the way, set on the highest possible visual settings and at the 60 frames per second, of course. That's why it's saying 60 there too. That's the refresh rate, not the actual frame rate. So it is a good phone for gaming. The flat screen, really do enjoy. And... Decent enough kind of sounding speakers and the GT mode does seem to help. The only trade-off is that it will get a little bit hotter and just throttle a bit less though. So that is good. Audio then with the Realme GT3. Well, of course, we don't have a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack, sadly gone, but use a Type-C adapter or get yourself something like these. These are the Sound Peats Capsule 3 Pros. I've just recently reviewed them. They've used up in my channel. They support LDAC. Uh, that's a very high bit rate. It's something like 900 plus kilobits per second Bluetooth streaming, and it basically sounds just like wired, even though, of course, it's wireless with Bluetooth tech there. And that gets past some of that problem there. And the LDAC support does actually come with this phone with the Qualcomm chipset, which is great. Now, loudspeakers, there's one at the top. There's one down the bottom here. They're okay. Uh, I wouldn't say they're the best loudspeakers I've heard, but they're not too bad. I'd rate them as average um, at best. But here is a sample of one of the clips and the soundtracks that I do use. 100% volume. It's just to give you an idea here of what you can expect. Camera performance now from the GT3. I do find it to be the area where I believe that they had quite a bit of cost cutting, at least in the ultra wide and the front facing camera can sometimes be, well, pretty average as you'll see right now. So I've got 1080p with image stabilization. I don't have, I believe there's only 1080p 30 frames per second. I can't find a 1080p 60 and there's certainly no 4K with this front facing camera. It has a tendency to often overexpose and I just find the stabilization to be all right. The quality in general, not so great here with the front facing camera. Let's have a look at the rear cameras for video quality and then onto stills. And you see what I mean that it's definitely the downside of the Realme GT3 here is the cameras. So there's a 4K sample now. This is the main camera. You cannot shoot 4K with the ultra wide, it's only 1080p. We've got electronic image stabilization with that 50 megapixel sensor. And you can shoot 4K. 60 frames per second and 30 which is what I'm filming at the moment here so the quality seems to be all right I would not rate this as the best that I have seen but for the price it's not too bad focus and these kind of conditions does not seem to have any issues at all it does have a very aggressive crop so the image when you start recording is a lot closer than what it actually looks like here so it's cropped in quite a bit for that electronic image stabilization, reducing the quality somewhat. So this is why it doesn't look as sharp as other phones there. This is the ultra wide now. So 1080p as mentioned is all it can do, the eight megapixel sensor. Uh, very poor looking ultra wide video at that too, which is the weakness, this camera, the eight megapixel ultra wide sensor that we have seen a lot of. They're still using it and it's all, I would say cost reduction to bring this price point and of course that blazing fast 240 watt charging is probably why they cheaped out a little bit with the ultra wide camera. Over to the stills now. What you're looking at here is a microfiber cloth and I'm using the microscopic two megapixel camera that trust me, you will probably never use. You'll use it once or twice when you first get the phone and that's it. It's just a useless camera to have and I don't even know why they honestly bothered to put it in there. Just to claim that it's got the third camera. The 8 megapixel ultra wide camera, at least it's not like the video quality I just showed you which had some jelly effects and issues. It's okay, I mean it's great, don't get me wrong that we've got an ultra wide camera, good option to have, you can fit more in the shot. Just don't expect it to be amazing and do not expect it to be flagship grade because it clearly isn't.
in our portrait shots, well, they come out all right. The main sensor, the IMX 890, is okay. Stitching's not amazing. And then the selfie shots from the 16 megapixel camera are, uh, again, just average, not too amazing. But the main camera, again, here with its optical image stabilization, that 50 megapixel sensor does show some promise at least. So the main camera sensor is a good one from Sony, and that's the camera that I would be using all the time. I would stay away from the ultra wide. But this main camera, I like what I'm seeing. The results are good. Finally, our low light performance with the Realme GT3 isn't too bad if you stick to the main sensor, which of course has the optical image stabilization, really helps lower the shutter rate, lets in more light, and the night mode shots here overall aren't bad at all. So it does have promise, again, the main sensor. Okay, so there's no denying that the charging time on this is absolutely fantastic. It's set a world record, but we do have Xiaomi up and coming with an apparent 300 watt charging that could be even faster, but it's not actually in a phone yet. It's just the tech that they've announced. And now this competition is good for us end consumers because of course it's win-win for us. We are getting for the same price points, faster charging, and the tech keeps improving. This competition is it's just good either way. It all works out better for us in the end. Now it is a phone that I find has quite a few compromises because while well, the cameras, as I showed you, there's a lot to be desired is the nicest way to put it when it comes to the video footage that uh, really it needs a lot of optimization. There was some jelly effect going on with the ultra wide, some glitches, audio bit rate is only 96 kilobits per second with the audio, so just downright poor. Selfie camera needs a bit of work. Uh, the main camera can take a decent shot, but really the weakness is the cameras uh, as it normally always is kind of with Realme 2 there. Now the screen is good, 144 hertz, but only if you run benchmarks. Uh, testing it out with developer options to show the refresh rate did show me there was a bit of a problem and there was a bit of a bug too where it locked into just 60 hertz no matter what setting I was using. So the firmware to me is early days, it's not stable, it's the first firmware, the first like release firmware for us tech channels out there, tech reviewers to check it out and there's a lot of work that's still needed that I can see here. Now the pricing of this phone did take me by surprise, not in a good way but in a bad way because I was thinking this could be around about say 550 euros, maybe 500 euros early bird price but no, 649 US dollars and I just think at that price point you're honestly better off if you don't need the fast charging getting the Realme GT2 Pro or the GT2 or say the OnePlus 11. I think for that price point, you're getting overall a better kind of package. Yes, apart from the charging speed. So thank you so much for watching my review of the Realme GT3. Hopefully we're going to see a GT3 Pro version later on in the year.